When I first started to learn about AAC, I was like, holy guacamole, this is going to open up a child's world. When I talk to educators and families and other therapists, they are often blown away by the research and by personal testimony on how AAC has impacted their child's world. AAC can help their child socially interact with others. They can be self-advocates and request objects and activities. They can share their thoughts and ideas at home and in the classroom. And that's just the tip of the iceberg right there. As excited and as motivated as we all are, we might be feeling a little overwhelmed and maybe a little discouraged when we don't see progress immediately. So I want to share with you five things that um, everyone should know when they first start off their AAC journey. This list has been compiled from um, talking to team members that I have learned with side by side and I've also trained. Hey, my name is Tracia. I'm a licensed speech language pathologist and the owner of Illuminate Family Workshop. I help overwhelmed grown-ups confidently support their child's speech and language goals. You are in the right place for expert tools and innovative ideas. So hit subscribe to get notifications on new episodes. All right, let's get into this list of five things that you need to know when you start your AAC journey. Be sure to stay till the very end where I give you my bonus tip. So it's a list of six. Number one, you're learning with the child. You're not gonna know where everything is, they're not gonna know where everything is, but guess what? That creates a really natural, amazing opportunity for learning and also for bonding and relationship building, rapport building. I was working once with a kindergartner with a new AAC device and I did not know the program, but we were playing with toys. It was a child play-based therapy lesson. You can still do that with AAC. And um, we were looking for the word dog. We were playing with a little dog. And what I did was model my thought process back to her so she would have that internal dialogue too. So we were looking for dog and I was like, hmm, I wonder if it's in the groups. Let's check out the groups. And ha, huh, a dog is a, well, it's not a, it's not school supplies, it's an animal. Hmm, let's check in the animals button. So the animals cat a folder opened up um, a couple other categories in there and I'm like, well, animal, well, dogs are pets, so let's check out pets. So um, I did that with a lot of the different buttons that we were finding together. And I did that even when I was adding buttons or editing buttons to include her favorite toys or her teacher's names and things like that. And let me tell you, by the end of the school year, she was adding and editing her own buttons. So you don't have to know everything. You can be prepared, but be prepared to also learn side by side. Number two is to focus on the keywords. Don't stress out about modeling full grammatical sentences. If you need a starting point, I suggest core words. These are gonna be your building blocks to language and they're also the most versatile. So they're words like not, want, um, like, stop, go. Words that can be used across a variety of settings. So that's different than the word bubbles, which is also a really important word. Um, but bubbles can only be used for bubbles. Um, core words can be used for a bunch of different things. So think high repetition of high frequency words in a variety of communication functions. I think I'll do another video on communication functions so we can take a deeper dive on that. So look out for that. Number three, have it available and have it charged. Allow the child to have access to the device. So if you're at home, maybe that means having the device um, in a special spot in the living room where they're at, and maybe in the, if they're in the kitchen, a special spot in the kitchen. So this means that they, if they're independently ambulating around the room, they can go to the device, be curious about it, engage with it, low pressure. Um, they can play with the buttons on there. They can pick their favorite button and hit it a bunch of times and just let them be curious with it. It's gonna really help us out in the long run as we're using it as a tool. So keep it available, keep it charged. Oh, another tip too is that depending on the device that you have, you um, are able to modify the settings on there so that the app is the only thing that opens up. So say if you have other, um, it's not recommended, but if you have other apps on there that you use for maybe other therapies or maybe you have games on there um, so that when they open their device, they only see the communication system. So talk with your therapist. There's definitely a way to do that. 
Number four is going to be to respect the no and to be mindful of sensory regulation as that's the first step, literally first step. And then also in the visual I'm about to show you the first step on the language staircase. So most children that I work with are highly motivated to use AAC, but that doesn't mean that they don't have their days when they are not feeling it. And also when they don't have their moments when they're sensory, they're highly dysregulated and um, forcing a device on them or um, they're just not in their optimal learning zone. So let's talk about what that optimal learning zone might look like. So this is a visual by Jesse Ginsberg. She is a speech language pathologist and the creator of Inside Out, a sensory program for SLPs. I'll put a link in the description below so you can get your own downloadable copy. But for right now, let's zoom into the staircase here. Okay, so when we're looking at the staircase, you'll notice that regulation and engagement are at the bottom steps. And then we've got basic language, which are maybe the middle steps. And then the higher level language and cognitive skills are the top steps. And then there's also a banister that represents the child's intrinsic motivation. So let's say a child is dysregulated. It's kind of like the bottom steps of the staircase are missing. And that makes it really difficult for the child to access the rest of the staircase. This means that sensory processing differences can really impact the child's ability to engage, communicate, and use those higher level cognitive skills. So when we're first thinking about um, improving a child's communication, we want to think about how we're going to stabilize the staircase, those bottom steps, and strengthen um, those bottom steps. So that means we are focusing in on regulation and engagement. Another key component to building language is going to be to encourage the child to hold on to the banister. So in other words, we're going to need to ensure that our activities are intrinsically motivating to the child, and we're focusing on cultivating the child's interest, having fun, and building strong connections. All that is said in the um, little narrative part of the visual below. All right, so number five is to remember your why. Like I said earlier, you're learning something new and when we're grown-ups learning something new um, we might bump up against fears of being a beginner maybe um, putting a lot of pressure on ourselves to get it perfect when I remember why I'm doing what I'm doing it helps me take all that pressure off of me because it's not about me it's about helping the child and it helps me get into a better headspace so I'm in my optimal learning zone and optimal um, teaching zone Connecting what I'm doing to my larger why really helps me get out of my feelings and helps me become more present. Number six is to call in your crew. Lean on your team. All those people who love and care about your child, your family, your friends, your school team, your private practice team, your coaches. Let them know what you're learning by sharing this video with them. Having a team like this really helps us stay accountable and it helps us celebrate the wins together. Who is someone that you're grateful for on your team? Let me know in the comments below. I'll see you next time.